Hello and welcome to video lecture series in sociology. Today we are going to discuss chapter 6 titled as Globalization and Social Change from your textbook Social Change and Development in India. This chapter is divided into four parts. So far we have discussed about the concept of globalization. We discussed how globalization affects our lives, taking example from Indian society. We have discussed about globalization and also raised an important question that is globalization a new phenomena? Today we will discuss about economic dimensions of globalization. According to noted sociologist Anthony Giddens, globalization in many respects is not only new but revolutionary as well. There are many dimensions and aspects of globalization that can be analyzed in social, economic, political and cultural spheres. But all these aspects are interconnected and interrelated. In this lecture, we will discuss about economic aspects of globalization in particular. Let us begin with economic dimensions of globalization. The economy is central to how we understand or define globalization. Among various dimensions of economic globalization, the economists focus on economic dimensions. To understand economic globalization, let us ask a simple question. Does global economy exist? According to hyperglobalists, the world is now borderless and so are the economies and goods and services are traded across boundaries. A global economy exists within a global capitalist system. On the other hand, transformationalists, the other approach to globalization, they agree that progressively economies are acquiring a global character. There is a movement of labor and capital across boundaries. International organizations like WTO and International Monetary Fund IMF, also govern movement of goods and capital. But there are still significant restrictions existing among nations regarding exports, imports, taxes, tariffs and duties. These are still largely under the control of the national governments. And skeptics on the other end of the spectrum claim that internationalization of economy happened hundreds of years back and the current phase of globalization is just a continuation of the old process. They also hold the view that the nation state in this scenario has acquired all the more a greater power to determine the nature of economic relationships between different countries and they still hold most of the power. But no matter how they explain and what causes they attribute, there is more or less a general agreement that globalization has led to growing interdependence between different people, regions and countries in the world as social and economic relationships come to stretch worldwide. An interesting way to understand the intensity, depth or penetration of globalization in everyday life is to think of the times before globalization. What were those times like? Let's understand this. Prior to globalization, distance was measured in terms of time. Say if you have to move from place A to B, people used to say it will take two days to travel to that place. That means we were measuring distance according to the number of days we used to move from one place to another. Distance mattered because it took lot of time for people and information to travel from one place to another. Boundaries or territories were rigidly defined that demarcated functional areas as in and out of a specific boundary. Say this is village A as inside and village B as outside the specific boundary. Same is the case with customs and traditions and culture which were tied to time and space culture or tradition of society A, which is of a particular point of time. People were unaware of the wide diversity that was existing other than their own cultures and customs. Can you identify the ways in which globalization has become an integral and inseparable part of our lives, beat any sphere of life? It may be difficult to imagine and separate those aspects as they are so intricately, that means complexly related to one another. Let us take some examples to see how globalization has affected our lives. Let us take example of a person called as say Sham Sundar. Sham Sundar was a graduate. He did master's degree in mass communication and media studies. He works in a call center. His office timings are different from timings of his friends. He goes to work in the evening. He is called as Sam in his office, S-A-M, the short form for Sham Sundar. He also speaks English in a very different accent with clients who are located or calling from a distance of thousands of miles. He works in the night shift because then it is daytime in the US. 
Sam is working for people whom he'll probably never meet or see in his lifetime. He greets them on their festivals and important occasions. Let us take another example of a girl called as Deepika. Deepika is from a small village and has been very good in studies throughout her life. Even with limited facilities, she learned computers and got good marks in school and college degrees. She is offered a job with a decent salary in city in a multinational corporation. Deepika wants to take this opportunity but her family has some reservations. Finally, after much discussion, Deepika decides to take up the job in the multinational company and she starts living in the city. Let's take another example. Ravindra had promised his son a computer if he secures good marks in his final exams. When his son does well in the final exams, both of them go to buy a computer. They look for many brands and qualities and decide to buy one which is affordable and has maximum features. After market survey, they decide to buy a particular brand of computer. This brand is from United States of America, that is US. It is manufactured in China and it is being sold in India. What do these examples illustrate? These examples show one or the other aspect of globalization. While Sham Sundar or Sam is part of the global workforce and economy, Ravinder is consuming a commodity that is made in other part of the world and is consumed in this part of the world. Deepika illustrates example of conflict of modern and traditional values. See, traditionally women were denied many opportunities, but gradually they are becoming part of everyday life and this is greater acceptability now. Thus, globalization is used in various contexts with much ease as compared to the previous years. Even if some of these patterns were already existing in the early stages of capitalism, yet these changes are significant because the magnitude of this change is far beyond imagination and comprehension of people. Some of these changes, particularly in the field of technology and means of communication, have revolutionized the way we work and live. There are many people who believe that globalization has more negative consequences as compared to the positive consequences. For instance, many farmers engaged in contract farming in India have committed suicide in some regions of central India because their crops failed. They could not pay back the loans taken for the expensive agricultural input they had bought from multinational corporations. The move to allow foreign direct investment, that is FDI in retail sector, is being intensely opposed by small shopkeepers or retailers as they fear that in the wake of competition with global giants, their small shops cannot survive or exist. So, economic dimensions of globalization involve a stretching of economic relationships throughout the world and emergence of global economic tendencies, where markets become interrelated and interdependent. This stretching is pushed by certain economic policies. Very broadly, these policies or the process in India is termed as liberalization. Liberalization refers to relaxation of restrictions by the government in social and economic policies. In the field of economy, liberalization refers to removal of tariffs, subsidy, restrictions on goods and services between the trading nations. The term liberalization refers to a range of policy decisions that Indian state took since 1991, that is in the last two decades, to open up the Indian economy to the world market and global competition. Liberalization meant the steady removal of the rules that regulated Indian trade and finance. These measures are also described as economic reforms in India that initiated LPG, liberalization, privatization and globalization. What were these economic reforms? Since 1991, a series of reforms in all major sectors of the Indian economy were initiated with a view that Indian economy would benefit by getting integrated with the world economy. Hence, the policy of liberalization was adopted along with greater privatization. Privatization means opening up of those areas of economy for private ownership which had so far been closed and controlled by the government. Liberalization of economy helps public sector units to modernize and diversify also. It also helps in improving quality of goods and services delivered and enhances competitiveness of these organizations. Liberalization in India marked a break with the policy of the government to have a greater control over the economy that happened in the past. 
The state after independence had put in place a large number of laws that ensured that the Indian market and Indian indigenous businesses were protected from worldwide competition. However, in the last two decades, liberalization of economy meant opening economy to global competition in which small enterprises may face crisis. It also meant taking loans from international institutions such as International Monetary Fund or IMF. These loans are given on certain conditions that involve a policy of structural adjustments and institutional changes. These adjustments usually mean cuts in the state expenditure on social sector, such as state is asked to cut expenditure on health, education and social security. The globalization of economy has led to a rise in number of transnational corporations which are also called as TNCs. TNCs are based in or trade in or are owned in several countries. This means these companies produce goods or provide services in more than one country. They can be located, their head offices can be located in one country, their production can be done in some other place and their products are sold all over the world in different markets. These are transnational practices or transnational companies. Some of the important TNCs are in the field of, say, sports wear, merchandise, gold rings, cars, and many other things. According to Leslie Saclair, transnational corporations have an immense impact on our lives, and they are in many cases more powerful and hold more wealth than many small countries. The driving force behind these TNCs is the pursuit of profit at global level. These corporations can be small firms with one or two factories outside the country in which they are based or they could be a very big or a big corporation and their operations might crisscross the entire globe. Some of the biggest transnational corporations are the companies which have their operations all over or around the world. Leslie Saclair also talks about emergence of transnational capitalist class. This is called as TCC other than TNCs. In fact, transnational capitalist class consists of people who run TNCs, that is transnational corporations. The TCC is a class of people or a group of people who work for the progress of the global capitalist project. This class includes executives, bureaucrats, politicians, professionals, merchants and people from media. The electronic economy is another factor that underpins economic globalization. Large amount of money exchanges hands within seconds. Banks, corporations, fund managers and individual investors are able to shift funds internationally with a click of mouse. This has been made possible by revolution in the field of communication and technology. The revolution in information and technology has led to globalization of finance as well. The financial markets all over the world are integrated and people can trade in stocks in any part of the world now. Financial markets world over carry out transactions worth billions of dollars within seconds through the electronic circuits. The trading in capital and security markets happens around the clock. You can take examples of New York, Tokyo, London as some of the key centers of financial trading. Mumbai is known as the financial capital of India. However, moving electronic money instantaneously carries it with great risk. As we have seen in the recent past, that how Indian stock market became vulnerable to sudden rise and dips because seeing the Sensex going up, the foreign institutional investors were buying stocks in majority. They made quick profit and then sold them off very quickly and quit the market. Yet another important dimension of economic globalization, like financial globalization, is the spread of knowledge or weightless economy. The global economy is no longer primarily agriculture or industrial in nature. It is a knowledge economy. What do we mean by knowledge economy? A knowledge economy is a kind of economy in which much of the workforce is involved not in the physical production or distribution of material goods, but in the process of designing, development of technology, marketing, sale and service of goods and services. This is also called as the tertiary sector in which we are not indulging in any kind of manufacturing the physical goods, but in terms of development of certain ideas which are exchanged all over the world. In knowledge economy, products have their base in information such as computer software, consultancy business, media, entertainment products and internet based services. 
Knowledge economy can range from the neighborhood catering services to large organization involved in providing a host of services for professional meets like conferences, personal family events like weddings and birthdays. So, in brief, globalization refers to increasing interconnectedness and interaction between economies of different countries all over the globe. It involves increasing integration of financial markets, intensification of trade, free flow of technology and knowledge, and free movement of labor globally. To conclude, let's summarize what we discussed in this lecture. In this lecture, we discussed about the economic aspects of globalization and different points of view of certain theorists called as skeptics, hyperglobalist, and transformationalist on the economic globalization. We also discussed some examples of how globalization is present in our daily lives. We discussed about electronic economy and knowledge economy as the processes driven by globalization of economy. In the next part of this chapter, we will discuss about global communication and rise of international division of labor. Till then, you can enjoy reading this part of the chapter. Thank you.